tribal trails The Son of God, He is near He chose to walk with us These tribal trails Tribal trails, tribal trails Hi! Glad that you tune in to Travel Trails and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ with us. According to the Bible, the meaning of His birth is not about giving gifts, feasting on good foods, or even spending time with family and friends. Christmas was a fulfillment of God's promise to us. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. After the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, Matthew said, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So about 700 years later, God stepped into the history of mankind, not only to save you and me from sin, but also to be with us every step of the way to meet the deepest need of our hearts. Ron Freeman, our first guest, could identify with that. I'm from the tribe of the Lumbee in, in North Carolina, and basically our religion is Christianity. And I was saved when I was six years old. We struggle a lot, we fall a lot, We've been through a lot in our life as a tribe, as a people. And you can probably attest to that. And a lot of times you just feel like you're worthless. Mm -hmm. I finished high school, started public work, and kind of met this young girl. And uh, we had a relationship together. I mean, it, it, you know, you fall, fall in love with your first love. And then th things kind of went sour after that. Actually, what had happened, her dad didn't like me. Um, at the age of 19, I was on the verge of committing suicide. I didn't think anybody cared for me. And I said at that point I was saved, but I had drifted away. And, um, you know, you get to a point in life where you, you're lonely. You feel like nobody cares. I got to a point where I didn't even think that my own mother loved me. And to give you an experience of how God's love is, how the love of Jesus Christ, when you accept him as your personal savior, even though you feel like you drifted away, he's always there. And he proved it that afternoon in my mom's house. I heard a small, soft voice says, Ronald, I love you. You know, me being there in those woods by myself, it like scared me to death. And I'd never heard anything like that before. But it was so soft, it was so sweet, it was so warm. And I got right back to the edge of the field before stepping up into my mom's yard. And uh, the Lord said, Ronald, I love you. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Conrad, I went in my house, went to my bedroom, took my gun off of my bed, I unloaded it, put it in my shelf, put my gun back up, you know, I've never had that desire to do it again because I felt a love that day that I've never felt before. And um, the rest is history. I've been traveling and singing uh, with Glenn now for a little over 33 years, and, and uh, I have a beautiful wife the Lord gave me. I have two beautiful children, two beautiful grandchildren, and uh, things don't always go like we want to, but, you know, the Lord said if we would unite and depend on Him, you know, may not get what we want, but we get what we needed. That's basically my life's history right there in a nutshell. But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law.
But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love the Lord Jesus. Look down from the sky and stay. God wants you and me to come to him in childlike faith, just as the song says, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. On this Christmas, I encourage you to make this prayer your response to God's great love through Jesus Christ. As said in John 3:16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you'd like somebody to pray with, give us a call. We're glad to hear from you. Some people think Christianity is a white man's religion. I'm glad that David Dunn is here today to share his insight into this topic. He starts with defining the word religion. We speak of religion as including all of the belief systems of the world that have to do with um, a spiritual nature. So we need to understand exactly what a religion is. And uh, the word religion comes from a Latin word, a verb, which means to cling to something, to hang on to something, uh, religare. And uh, the word religare comes into the form of religion as a noun as reflecting what we hold on to as a set of beliefs what we believe to be true. An atheist is religious. Personally, I don't believe that there is an atheist <laughs> because I believe it deep inside, you know. But uh, uh, it doesn't matter what uh, set of beliefs a person holds on, at any place on earth and, and how widely different they are from each other. They are all religions. Now, there is this truth to it. Christianity is different and unique from all other religions. All religions, other than Christianity, feature mankind trying to fathom God and, and reaching up to God and trying to appease God so he's not angry with them. Christianity is the exact opposite. It features God reaching down to man and uh, providing for mankind what man could not provide for himself. Uh, humans, beginning with Cain, it would seem, when he said, uh, I will offer what I want to offer to God, uh, have always wanted to give uh, to whatever they understand the divine being to be, uh, what they want to give to him. And it becomes a system of works. Uh, sometimes it involves things as hideous as child sacrifice, uh, and mutilations uh, and all kinds of things that uh, are expected to give them merit before God and to ease his wrath with them. But the Christianity uh, presents a savior who has done the work. Uh, Christianity presents uh, a God who is appeased. The sacrifice has been paid. Sins are forgiven. Peace with God. You know, and I personally don't know of any other religion that has uh, this sense of sins forgiven and a sure home in heaven, if I can put it that way now. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. When we think of religion, we should recognize that Christianity is uh, unique from all other religions, and that's the starting point. <clears throat> but uh, I would ask the question, uh, you know, if uh, Christianity is a white man's religion, uh, was Jesus a white man? fact is he wasn't. <laughs> you know, the originator of Christianity was born into the Jewish people or nation. Uh, he was Middle Eastern, uh, probably fairly dark or olive-skinned and most likely black hair. Uh, he was the sort of typical uh, Middle Eastern person living in the land of Israel. King Solomon said, my son, obey your father's commands and don't neglect your mother's instruction. When Jesus was 12 years old, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem for the annual Jewish high feast called the Passover. When they started back home, they thought he was with them, but instead Jesus had stayed behind. They returned to the city to look for him. Three days later, they found him in the temple talking with the Jewish religious teachers. Whose child is this that asks these questions? He's from Nazareth. We thought he had left with us. Please forgive him his zeal. Everyone who heard him was amazed. Son, why didn't you stay with us? Your father and I were terribly worried. We couldn't find you. Why didn't you look here in the temple first? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Jesus went back to Nazareth with Joseph and Mary. There he grew wise and strong, and he gained favor with God and people. A young boy went to the temple in Jerusalem one day. He came to see the scholars and hear what they would say. These holy men were teachers, but he taught them instead. They asked him many questions. The conversation went like this. What's your name, son? On my mother's side, my name is Jesus, but on my father's side, Call me Emmanuel. How old are you? On my mother's side, I'm now 12 years old. But on my father's side, I have always been. Where are you from? On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. But on my father's side, it's New Jerusalem. What's your plan? On my mother's side, I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, in three days I will rise. And I'll sit at my father's side. And then we think about the others who were a part of God's program that we find in the Bible, the program of redemption, were the prophets, white men. They weren't, they were all Middle Eastern. Uh, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, were they white men? Answer is no, they weren't. Uh, they, were, they were darker skinned. Uh, and it is possible that uh, that one of the disciples in particular may even have been a, a black man. Mm. Uh, so that um, Jesus and those who originated or were a part of the founding of the church uh, were, were not white in the, in the sense that we think of it today. We look at the first converts uh, to Christianity. The very first convert was the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip preached the gospel to, and he almost very definitely was black. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the word church, which is in the Greek, ekklesia, uh, ek, 
out to call out, and then Klesia comes from Kaleo to call. Mm -hmm. And so the church is composed of those who have been called out. One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? Some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah, while others say you're one of the prophets of long ago that's come back to life. What about you? Who do you say I am? You are God's Messiah. You shall tell no one of this. The Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. He will be put to death. But three days later will be raised to life. Later before his ascension, Jesus said to his disciples, It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. The church is not a building, and the church is not uh, a, a particular type of religion in one part of the world and a different type of religion in the other. The, the, the church is made up of people that have been called out by God from all the nations of the earth, beginning with uh, the people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, the very first um, gospel call uh, to people to repent of their sins and to believe in the death and the uh, sacrifice of Jesus uh, and his resurrection. Uh, beginning with that and then moving outwards, uh, we, we understand that God was, was uh, pulling into one spiritual body people from all over the world that believed in his son. You probably remember in Acts uh, where Peter had been called to go to the house of Cornelius up in Caesarea. He was a rather separatist, prejudiced Jewish person at the time. Even though he was a disciple of Jesus, he went reluctantly. And the first thing he said when he went into Cornelius' house is, I hope you realize that it's, it's not legal for me to be here. Uh, what do you want? <laughs> you know, I think he was quite put out about the whole thing. But then, uh, then he was prompted by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel. And as he did, then the Holy Spirit fell on them exactly as he had on the day of Pentecost. As in his eyes were opened up, he actually came to understand the vision that he had had when uh, the messengers came to ask him to come to the house of Cornelius, you know, that sheet lowered down with all kinds of animals and he was told to rise and eat and he said, no, they're unclean. God said, don't call unclean what I have created. You know, and so uh, Peter, I think, understood that. And then when he went up to Jerusalem and reported to the church in Jerusalem what had happened, in a very real sense, he was in trouble. He was called on the carpet. And he said to the, to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, let me just tell you what happened. If I tell you what happened, I think you'll see things the way I see it. And so he told them about his vision in Joppa. He told them about going to the house of Caesarea. Uh, he told them that he had said, I, I shouldn't be here. But uh, he said, I began to preach to them the Lord Jesus and his resurrection. And lo and behold, the Holy Spirit fell on them exactly the same as he did on us at Pentecost. And Peter said, who was I that I could try and stop this? And as you read that account in the book of Acts, uh, you see a very beautiful thing. It says that the leaders in Jerusalem, including James, the brother of Jesus, listened. They remained silent for a little bit. They were thinking about it. And then they said, and I'll paraphrase, well, for goodness sakes, the Lord has opened the door of repentance to the Gentiles. And then what did they do? I personally love it. They glorified God. He spoke and they all listened, amazed at what they heard. How taught this boy from Bethlehem? 
to understand God's word. Could he be the son of God who would suffer so much pain? They knew that he was special, so they'd asked him again. He was the son of God, yet the son of man. And I can't help but wonder how Joseph must have felt. When through an open door that day, he heard his son reply. He said, you see, I'm the king of kings that's on my father's side. It's your name, son. On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side, they call me Emmanuel. I'm now 12 years old, but on my father's side, I have always been. Where are you from? On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem, but on my father's side, it's New Jerusalem. What's your plan? On my mother's side, Fine, but on my father's side, in three days I will rise, and I'll sit at my father's side. Amen. Jesus is the King of Kings, sitting on the right hand side of God the Father and praying for believers. That does make a difference when believers from different walks of life work together to extend God's kingdom. Before he met Glenn West and the Lumber River, Ron was singing with the family group for 18 years. Glenn recalls his first meeting with Ron in 1985. He came to us and uh, wanted to try out for the tenor position. And when he came in, I, I'll be honest with you, I was a little skeptical whether he would, would make it or not. But so I really put him to the test with hard songs and, and that sort of thing. And I really tried to discourage him uh, from making the group. But he blew my mind at how willing he was to work and to, to try everything I asked him. And I, had to tell, I have to say when he left, I told the guys, I said, I won't have a bit of problem working with this guy right here. And it's the best decision that, that we ever made. Back in 1985, when we first met, you know, I had the long hair and, and had the little mustache and all this. My being at me being native, he, he didn't like long hair, period. Because his dad was a soldier and he always he had to keep the GI cut all the time. So I had long hair. When I walked in, all these guys had long, uh, short hair and I had long hair. So he didn't like me to start with. So. Uh, but like I said, he tried everything he could uh, to break my spirit that night from singing. But I had to make it in my mind. I was going to try my very best, whatever it took. Uh, apparently, it was pretty good. Uh, we've been together since 1985. We are still the only two original members of the of Lumber River Quartet that started in 85. This guy right here, uh, he's been my right-hand man for 33 years. Um, even though we sing together, like we was talking a little while ago, we're still brothers. I tell him he's my brother from another mother. And, um, but um, we share a lot together. We cry together. I guess traveling together and stuff like that, you really bond together. Yeah, I tell a lot of people that uh, we talk more closer than my own brothers and I do, you know. And my brothers all live nearby me at home, but I hardly ever see them. I see him a whole lot more you know, and the other guys than I do my own family, right? Except for my wife and child. When I'm, I, we're home during the week for the most part. We're homebodies. Uh, when, when the last notes hit and the amen said on the 15th of October, uh, I'll get us home as fast as I possibly can. In spite of their differences, whether in ethnic background, personality, or status, Ronald and Glenn are of the same mind in Christ. The Apostle Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For by one spirit 
we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Paul continued to say, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the many members in the body have to depend on one another to function in unity. Do you know why today we have so many problems in our society? The Bible has an answer. The last verse in Judges says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. By nature, we're all self-centered. We don't take the needs of others into consideration when we're deciding on major issues in government, school boards, or family. We don't even let God have the final say in our decisions. We reap what we sow as a result. But God wants to change that. He doesn't want us to suffer. He wants us to do what is right in His sight. That's why 2,000 years ago, He sent His Son to deal with our sin problem. Jesus died on the cross for our sin and then rose from the dead so that by faith we can reconcile to God. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved. God's Spirit helps you to live your life in a way that would please God. Would you put your faith in Christ today? If you need help, call us. We'd love to hear from you. In Luke chapter 1. The angel said to Mary, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. He's the creator, the maker of this whole world and all within. He's my savior, redeemer, Yes, that's who Jesus is. If you ever need him, here's this verse to tell you what he'll do for you. Listen. Now, if you're on trial down in the valley, he will be your help and your best friend. And if you need forgiveness, just call upon his name. But don't forget to praise him for who he is. Cause he's the great shepherd, teacher, preacher, and the master of the wind. He is the healer, provider. He is the beginning and he is the end. He's the creator. The maker of this whole world and all within. He is my Savior, Redeemer. Yes, that's who Jesus is.